Father God, we just thank you so much for this time that we get to spend together, God, lifting your name. And Lord, I just pray for our time together this morning, God, that you would just begin stirring in our hearts, drawing us closer to you, God, God knitting our hearts together as women, um, Lord, and just help us to open our ears and open our minds and open our hearts to hear what it is that you would have us hear this morning. So God, we love you and we say all of this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. You ladies may be seated. We have a very special treat for y'all this morning. Um, I did say y'all. I lived in the South for three and a half years, so sometimes it slips out. So anyway, um, we had invited uh, Rachel Baker to come and teach with us this morning, and she was all excited and then realized she left town this morning at like 3 a.m. So she, but realized this last week, so she recorded her teaching, and then, so she's going to share with us, and then Pastor Kyle's going to come and kind of take it home after she's done. So with that, I'm going to queue up Rachel, and then Kyle will come up and conclude our teaching time together this morning. The other night, my eight-year-old was sitting at our dining room table working on his breakout homework. Okay, side note, for those of you that don't know, breakout is this incredible curriculum offered by our children's ministry here at LifePoint. If you have a kiddo, I think preschool through middle school, you got to get them in there. It's incredible. So what he read is this, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except for through me. I was just compiling my notes on this week's teaching, which is abiding in truth. When I heard his sweet voice booming because he reads very loud, I am the way, the truth. My mind was set on fire. The truth. Right there in the book of John, Jesus says exactly who he is. He is the truth. Truth is embodied in the personhood of Christ. That floored me for a moment. Not because this is new news to me, but because in the current context of our culture, the idea of truth seems to have become this ever-changing philosophical idea. But truth isn't ever-changing. There is no my truth, your truth, his truth, her truth. There is only the truth. Jesus Christ, the tangible, relational, personal truth, manifest in his word that is everlasting, true today, true tomorrow, and true forever here. And so I thought about abiding in truth, which really means abiding or dwelling in Christ. A really quick Google search yielded 31 various scriptures on abiding in Christ. We can meditate on those scriptures daily for a month. Imagine that. Imagine starting your day with the reminder to abide in Christ, which means to hang out with, remain with, continue in a state of, and to dwell with. To abide in truth is to dwell in Christ. Close your eyes for a moment, all of you, just for a second. I want you to visualize what living in Christ, dwelling within the Spirit of God, looks like. If this helps you visualize it better, think about God, or the Spirit of God, wrapping itself around you, almost like a cocoon. What does it feel like? Do you feel lighter? Safer? Protected, loved, do you feel forgiven, whole, do you feel rest? This is what it is to dwell in Christ. I think again about my little guy reading those words, I am the truth, I am the life. And that's it. Our life source, the very air we breathe, the gift and the challenge to us on this earth. Whether you are eight or 108, the invitation this week is to dwell in Christ. Colossians 2, 6 through 8 puts it like this. So then, just as you received Christ as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the element of spiritual forces on this world rather than on Christ. Friends, can't that last sentence sometimes describe us? Have you been taken captive by hollow philosophy, the my truth philosophy, and human traditions? Think about it. Do you have this little list in your mind of prerequisites you have in order to be in relationship with other people? Have you ever dismissed someone on the basis of an economic, racial, or political difference? Guilty. 
I've dismissed people, even people I love, because they don't know my Lord. And it makes my heart absolutely ache. And so sometimes it's just easier to turn off the noise and make my world and circle so small, not to see suffering and not to see need and the need for compassion and patience at my own feet. This isn't abiding in truth. This isn't dwelling in Christ. This isn't trusting God with outcomes and with people. This is apathy or control or chosen ignorance. If I don't see it, if I don't engage with them, it can't hurt me. It can't hurt my heart. It can't stir me to action. But why did we need Christ on earth? Why would he show up in the flesh to live a perfect life and die a blameless death if not for us to dwell in him? He gives us such simple directives as if to know that we in our humanity muck things up and overcomplicate the simple. Going back to John chapter 14 and down to verse 15, Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey what I command. And what did he command? Mark 12, 30 makes it very clear. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And the second is this, verse 31, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater command than these. It's simple. Love God with all of you. This is to dwell within the truth of Christ and then love your neighbor. This is to engage with the world, to be an image bearer of our Lord to those God has strategically placed around you. It's that simple. So I have a challenge for us. Here's the first one. If you haven't yet put your trust in Jesus Christ, I invite you to do that. Talk to your table leader or any one of the amazing women on our leadership team here. There is nothing more beautiful than walking with someone as they hand the reins of their life over to God. It's incredible. And here's the second challenge. Think about the people that live to the left and to the right of you. Maybe across the street, maybe behind you. This week, and actually through the end of the year, this is great because the holidays are coming, so it's a perfect excuse for you guys. Go introduce yourself. Now, I'm an introvert. Okay, I'm 50-50 an introvert. And I'm socially awkward. And honestly, getting to know my neighbors has always been super awkward. But I'm learning how simple acts of love can quickly build affection for one another. I want to tell you about my neighbor, Sally, really fast. The night we moved into town, there was so much snow on the ground that we had no place to park our moving truck. There was no way to get into the driveway, and our house backs up to a park, and behind us is this grouping of homes with a small kind of cul-de-sac of sorts. It was almost nine o'clock, and it was snowing and freezing outside when I knocked on the, her door. She lives right behind me, and she answered in her bathrobe. <laughs> it's a good way to get to know someone real fast when you answer the door in your bathrobe. I asked if we could park our truck in front of her house, and she kindly obliged. Did I really need to ask her? Probably not. But asking set the tone for our relationship. Since then, we've had multiple over-the-fence conversations. She asks about my kids and talks to my dogs. She gives me gardening tips and has made my four-year-old flower fairies out of hollyhocks. Then this month, she fell and broke her leg. Had we not already built a relationship, I would have never known that she fell. I wouldn't be looking for her over the fence and wondering why I hadn't seen her for a few days. But because we had built that relationship already, I'm able to send to bring her soup and flowers. I'm able to check in on her and help where she'll allow me to. This is that second command. Sally and I aren't of the same age. We're not of the same faith, probably not of the same political background. I mean, we're girls, so there's that. But other than that, we don't have all that much in common. But the command doesn't say, if your neighbors are the same as you love them. Nope. There's no caveat in that directive. I think this applies to the bigger picture as well. We are different from the world. We just are. You and I, we're different from the world. We are those crazy, Jesus-loving weirdos. That's how the world sees us. And I'm okay with it. 
But as Pastor Rick Warren put it, you don't have to see eye to eye to walk hand in hand. As you rest in the truth of Christ, I invite you to bring his love to those around you. These are the things that we will continue to talk about through the remainder of the Open Your Bible study. And I'm so excited to hear what God is doing in your life and through your life as you take on these challenges. Now, quickly, I want to say a huge thank you to someone who has spent the last 17 years doing exactly what I just challenged. She has brought community and truth and the word of God to the women of Life Point. She has created groups, built affection in us towards each other. What she has done is powerful and is worth honoring. And so I want to thank our director, Holly Hall, for stepping up, taking the lead 17 years ago, and building this beautiful ministry. Take it from here, Kyle. What I said was I think she's really cute. And if you find that awkward, she's my wife, just, just in case. <laughs> So I'm going to try to add, an emphasis, try to add to what she said, because I think uh, the content of what she said is really good. I mean, in by, abiding in the truth. I mean, I've, I've taught on truth here before. And by the way, I'm glad to be back here. I got invited back a third time. Aren't you guys, like, tired of hearing from me at this point? You sure? Have to hear from me on Sundays, or at least some of you do, and then you got to hear from me here, too. That's, that's like a lot. You're going to have to hear from me twice this week. So what I want to do today <clears throat> is I want to talk about how you abide in the truth. So when, when, when she was talking about um, John 15 and 14, um, these three chapters are really kind of unique uh, in the New Testament because they give us a great glimpse on the inner workings of what's called the, the Trinity. And so we're going to talk about the truth today, but I want to give a little preface of this first. And I apologize, I don't have slides for you guys today. I'm normally more organized than this, so sorry about that. But I'll, I'll make it simple and I'll repeat things. So if you want to write something down, if there's something of value that you think that you would like to write down, you can do that. So John 14, uh, 15, uh, and 16 are kind of unique because they give us an inside view on this word uh, called the Trinity. And the Trinity is actually not a word that's in the Bible. Uh, you can't find it. It's like, it's something that's implied. It's like if you look at our United States Constitution, the Air Force is nowhere found in there, but we have one and it's implied. And so the Trinity is this inner working of, of God's nature. And so uh, the Trinity is simply something that means that God is one in essence, meaning uh, they're all the same. Uh, the Jesus, Father, and the Holy Spirit are all the same in terms of their Godhood. They're all one in essence, but they're different in personhood. So Jesus, the Son, is not the same necessarily as the Holy Spirit or the Father. They're unique in their personhood, but they're one in essence. And the reason that is so important is because as we continue to look at how we abide in the truth, um, this is going to come up as Jesus is talking about us or talking to us in the scripture. So I'm going to read from, uh, I don't have slides today, but if you go to John chapter 16, most of the stuff I'm going to be reading it is from there. <clears throat> I'm going to read from John 13 real quick. And most of it is going to be John chapter 16, basically verses 7 to 15, somewhere around there. So one of the things I want to say is that everybody follows somebody. We all follow a person. And hopefully, as Christians, the person we're following uh, is Jesus. And so uh, Jesus asked people to be his disciples. And a person who is someone else's disciple is someone who kind of follows so closely to them that like when they kick up dirt, it gets on them. And so it, it, you're, you're following a person who's making a path. And so this is an illustration that I've used kind of with my kids is that as you grow up, you know, when you're, when you're following Jesus, especially if you give your life to Christ, you're, you're kind of really close to him at first. Maybe you, you describe it as you feel the presence of God. And, and I do think that that does happen. I, I think it, uh, some people call it the Christian high, but it's oftentimes that God's like, I'm with you, I'm near you, you need me to kind of be close to you at this time. And then eventually, kind of God says, okay, I've, I've taught you enough, you know, you need to help self-feed yourself, but I'm not going anywhere. And so I talk about Jesus being the path maker, and so for a while, we're going to follow him. And then at some point he goes, I just want you to follow the path that I've set before you as well. And so what happens is in John chapter 14, 15, and 16, Jesus starts to tell his disciples, hey, I'm, I'm leaving you. I'm, I'm not going to be with you soon, which is really hard because Jesus is fantastic at parties, right? Anybody who can turn water into wine will always be invited. <clears throat> Anybody who can make, you know, food materialize out of thin air, always invited. I mean, the tricks that he has is just incredible. You know, I'm, he's like, your cat's dead? Well, it's going to stay dead. But if your dog's dead, I will raise your dog up, you know, something like that. <laughs> Sorry for the cat people. So 
I mean, Jesus is just incredible, and his disciples loved him. They loved being around him. And then in John chapter 14 and 15 and 16, he, start, he starts to tell his disciples, hey, I've got to go, and it's actually better that I go. And one of the things I would love for you to write down is uh, that Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit. And one thing that may be weird to hear, but the Holy Spirit in us is better than Jesus in front of us. The Holy Spirit in us is better than Jesus being in front of us. And I'll describe, describe what that means in just a second. So Jesus tells his disciples, hey, I'm going away. And he, in fact, he says this in John chapter 13, verse 33. He says, my children, he's talking to his disciples, I will be with you only a little longer, and you will look for me. And just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. And they're probably like, how does this work? Like, you can only walk so fast, we'll run after you. If you hop on a camel, we'll hop on a camel. Like, what are you talking about, Jesus? And what I'm about to talk about and, and teach right now, I haven't taught on Sundays yet. And so you ladies get kind of an inside view. So will you please not tell anybody? That'd be great, because I haven't, I haven't done this yet on stage. So... Jesus is announcing, hey, I'm leaving. You know, you're, I'm not going to be with you uh, for, for a little while, and, but it's actually better that I go. And it says in John 16, 7, but very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. And they probably were like, it's not good. We want you to be in front of us. And he says, but unless I go, the advocate, the helper, another like me will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So there, there are some theological things to understand here. One, Jesus can't be in every place at every time. He, he's not omnipresent like that. You know, when God came down and, and decided to have a body, you know, he can only be in one place at one time. And so Jesus could only be in one place at one time. But when Jesus said, look, when I go, it's better for you because the Holy Spirit can be in all of you. So it's very, very different. And it's, it's much better, as Jesus is saying. And this will all come to relevance and truth in just a second. But Jesus wants them to look, I'm not leaving you. And the Greek word there, advocate, a helper, it kind of basically means, you know, you love me, meaning Jesus, you're going to love the Holy Spirit. He's just like me. And so he talks about that he is going. <clears throat> and so what is the Holy Spirit? I mean, we don't talk about the Holy Spirit a lot. And yet God's kingdom, how God is working in the world right now, happens through the Holy Spirit. And so we don't talk about him enough. And the Holy Spirit is related to abiding in and knowing the truth. That's why this is so important. So I want to give you three C words that describe who the Holy Spirit is. He is. I'm going to give them to you one at a time, and then I'm going to read a little bit of scripture on them. But the first one is, the Holy Spirit convicts us that we need a Savior. It convicts us. He convicts us. And conviction is not just like, a, hey, you did something wrong, and so you're convicted of a crime. It's like there's evidence involved with that, and he helps us understand that we need a Savior. So John chapter 16, Jesus is going to begin to talk about this, this inner relationship between Jesus, who is God, God the Father, who is God, and the Holy Spirit, who is God. And the disciples really don't understand how, how this works. And to be honest, we don't understand how this works. Uh, and that's kind of, that's fine. I said on one Sunday, the fact that we can't make sense of God actually makes sense. And so he convicts us that we need a Savior. So Jesus says in John 16, 9, the Holy Spirit <clears throat> will convict the world about sin because people do not believe in me, about righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you will see me no longer, and about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. <clears throat> so what Jesus is talking about here is he said, you know, there are a lot of problems in life, but the big ones are spiritual problems. The big ones are more than finances and more than uh, things that are happening in your life relationally. Those things are really big, but the really big stuff is based on spiritual things. And so Jesus is talking about the king of this world or the prince of this world, the Lord of the air. All of these are kind of names for Satan. And so there is this spiritual battle going on. And Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you alone to fight this spiritual battle. In fact, my spirit is going to reside within you. And I'm going to convict you that you need to continue to stay close to me. Because Satan and his demons, man, they want to hurt you. They want to hurt the world. But I am going to win. And it's not even going to be a fight. And the Holy Spirit will help us do that. So the first thing is the Holy Spirit convicts us that we need a Savior. And then the second one is that the Holy Spirit convinces us that Jesus is that Savior. That Jesus is that Savior. John 16, 12 to 15 says this, I have much more to say to you 
more than you now can bear. So Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's like, look, this is not the end of my teaching, but the way it's going to come to you is now through the Holy Spirit. But when he, the spirit of truth, interesting, right? You know, Rachel just said when she was quoting, you know, John 14, that Jesus says what? I am the way and the truth and the life. So Jesus calls himself the truth. And now in John chapter 16, he calls the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth. So Jesus is like, look, truth resides in me and truth will continue to be communicated to you through the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of truth. He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what may, what he will make known to you. And then Jesus starts to talk about the inner workings of the, the Trinity. And he says, and it can be confusing if you read it too fast, because all that belongs to God the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will be made known to you. So God the Father communicates to Jesus. They're kind of chatting it up. And then Jesus talks to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit talks to us. We're not sure exactly how all of that works. But what we do know is they all share this unique um, desire for people to know the truth because God is the truth. And so the Holy Spirit now communicates that to us. And the reason that's important is because, I don't know if you know this, but Jesus was not the first or the last person to say that he was the savior of the world. In fact, I met one of them. I don't know if you know this. So I was at a Starbucks with a volunteer one time and uh, we were in Costa Mesa um, and uh, Southern California. We were at the Starbucks and we happened to be sitting outside talking about something. And a guy leans over and he says, hey, I have a message from God that you need to hear. And I'm like, well, lucky for me, I'm in the right place. And so he leans over and he says, I want to let you know that God has told me that I am the savior of the world. And I'm like, man, this is so fortunate. I get to meet the savior of the world at a Starbucks. I mean, I'm so glad it didn't happen to like in it out because I wouldn't have been caffeinated. And I wouldn't have been awake for it. But because I was at Starbucks, I could handle this news. And so, you know, the volunteer and I are, are kind of like, well, now we're just curious, right? And so we, we, talk, we lean over to him and we're just like, you know, tell us about this. And he said, look, God told me that I'm the savior of the world. Things are gonna happen through me. And he, he kind of goes on, he kind of continues to talk. And somewhere along the way, I just stopped him. I said, look, I know that's not true. And he's like, well, how do you know? I said, well, the Holy Spirit only tells people things that have already been said about Jesus. You can't say anything new about Jesus if it contradicts Scripture. It has to go along with what Scripture already says. And Scripture has already told us who the Savior of the world is, and that's Jesus. And you're not tall enough to be Jesus, trust me. You're kind of short, you know, you don't have the beard right. You know, there are lots of things about this. And so the reason I bring up this illustration is that sometimes people will say, look, God spoke to me, and he does do that. And so what we need to do, though, is we need to go, man, is this from the Holy Spirit? And does it agree with Scripture? And does it agree with what Jesus already said? So there are some checks here that we need to do. And the reason for that is because truth is incredibly important. Imagine her and I, this person who is a, a volunteer, what if we believe leave this guy. And then we went to read our Bibles. And then we said, well, it says here that Jesus is the savior, but you claim to be the savior. Which one's correct? Guess who's wrong hundred percent of the time, anything other than scripture. And so the reason that the Holy Spirit is so powerful and so helpful is that the Holy Spirit helps convict us that we need a savior. And he also convinces us who the Savior is. And so the Holy Spirit does something with Scripture. Um, and so we're going to talk about that in just a second. So to review real quick, the Holy Spirit convinces us or convicts us that we need a Savior. Meaning, like, without Jesus, man, sin would just overrun our lives. So we're convicted that we need him. And then he convinces us that Jesus is that Savior. He tells us the truth about who Jesus is. And we're going to talk about how that happens. Because one of the hardest things is when you become a Christian, or if you become a Christian, if you're not, you go, how do I follow Jesus? I can't see him. I can't shake his hand. I can't give him a hug. I don't know what he looks like. Um, and so the primary way that we follow Jesus is found in Scripture. That's how we know who he is. And the Holy Spirit brings things out of Scripture that we couldn't know by ourselves. So the third C word is this. He clarifies what Jesus taught. So the Holy Spirit convicts us we need a Savior. He convinces us that Jesus is that Savior. And then thirdly, he clarifies what Jesus taught. And so uh, John 16 talks about that is where Jesus has taught some things. The Holy Spirit uh, says, yep, that is, that is totally true about Jesus. And then 
what's interesting, uh, and I have a question just real quick. Have you ever read your Bible and you've read a, a scripture a bunch of times, and then one day it just clicks, that you're just like, I've never read that before. You have read it before. You, ha- you have. But for some reason, that day, or whatever you were going through, or it's probably just the Holy Spirit, he brings it out, and you gain new understanding. Has that ever happened to you? So it, th- there's a technical term for that. It's called illumination. It's, it's when the Holy Spirit brings out uh, the sensus plenier, which is just a fancy way of saying the fullest sense of Scripture. And that's, that's kind of unique to the Holy Spirit. And the reason I know that is because when I was an atheist and I read scripture, uh, I didn't have the Holy Spirit. So I read it for critique. I didn't understand everything is in there. I was against it. And then when I became a Christian, the Holy Spirit brought out the meaning of the text to me, things that I couldn't have known. I couldn't have known even with a biblical degree is that the Holy Spirit says, hey, now that you are for Jesus, let me tell you what it says about him. And so that's what happens when you read the Bible is the, the Holy Spirit illuminates or brings light into the word that God has said about Jesus Christ. So that's why the Holy Spirit is so important. And that's why he helps us abide in truth. We have to read scripture in order to know who Jesus is. The Holy Spirit confirms who he is, it convicts us, and he convinces us of who Jesus is. So they all have to work together. What Jesus said, what scripture said, that's how we find out what Jesus says. And then the Holy Spirit, they all work together to help us abide in the truth. And so the reason this is all important especially scripture. So there is a danger here. If you were to not read scripture and only try to go by what you think the Holy Spirit says, you'll often think of the Holy Spirit as a feeling. And he's more than that. He's so much more than that. And so sometimes people will do is they will go, uh, I don't need a, a lot of scripture or I just don't read it a lot. I just wait for God to speak to me. And sometimes that does happen. But a lot of the times we often have an inner voice inside our heads or we think something or we want something to happen. And so we tell ourselves that that's God telling us something. And it may be, do you know how you check? You read scripture. That's what it, that's what helps. So they all have to work together. So um, you guys are gonna be on your small groups in just a second, but I wanted to know, Do you have any questions for me? Is there something you'd like to know based on what we've said today, based on what Rachel has said? I'm happy to stay for a little while if you have some questions or comments. I can give you a couple minutes to think about it. Do you want do you want that? We talked about a lot today, so it's kind of it's kind of a lot. Or maybe it's so clear none of you have questions. That would be fantastic. (laughs) That like never happens. I've never had anybody say, You're so clear. (laughs) It's always like, I don't understand what you said. Yes. Yeah, and, that's, and it's also helpful to understand that Satan can also use Scripture to justify things, right? He did that with Jesus. And so that's why reading and knowing Scripture, you can't just know what it says. You have to know what it means, right? And so when Jesus is out in the desert, Satan visits Jesus, and he uses Scripture against Jesus, which is fantastically comical. Because Jesus is probably like, hey, you know I wrote that book, right? <laughs> you know, you know, I was, I was kind of there when that happened. So... So you do have to know what it means, not just what it says. And so knowing, and that's why spending a lot of time in scripture is really helpful because Satan can talk to you. Again, I don't know how that works. It could be through a person. It could be through an experience. Um, it could be verbally. Uh, it could be in your thoughts and head. Um, but just know that every person who is in Christ has the power to make Satan flee. Uh, scripture tells us that. We do not need to be afraid of him. <clears throat> so it can be. And that's part of the reason reading and knowing what scripture says and means and praying about it so that we can resist Satan. Uh, that's a big deal. Yes. Do you have a question? Yeah, go for it. I mean, it's not much different than now that I'm a Christian. I'm like, this doesn't make sense. You know, it, it, <laughs> how, how does this, how does this work? I mean, it's not. I was just a jerk about it. Like now, I'm less of a jerk about it. But um, back then, I was like, these Christians are morons. Like you can't 
you can't, God can't be one and three at the same time. That mathematically does not make sense, you know? And so for me, I was like all logical and I was like, one is not three. That's why we have two numbers, you know? That doesn't make sense. <clears throat> so, you know, I, I think as an atheist, I probably had a viewpoint of who Jesus was that he could not be God. You know, because I was like, one, he's got a body. You know, so I went through all the all the things. Like, he's got a body. He was born at a certain time and place. He died. You know, and so I kind of went logically through all that to go. He can't be God. I don't know who this Holy Spirit is. Sounds like a ghost on Halloween or something like that. Um, but God the Father, I guess I could believe in that. So it was kind of like, I kind of tried to take it apart logically, which doesn't make sense because logically the Trinity doesn't make sense. So you can't lose logic to figure it out. So I just like defeated my own argument. It was great. <clears throat> an aha moment yeah i mean my story can be told another time but it, it it took three years and going to a funeral and like um researching a bunch of different religions and and finding people who were who could model what christianity looks like it took me also realizing i didn't have to wear robes and carry a big bible all around to become a christian so there, there was a lot there yeah any more questions All right, well, I'm going to pray for us, um, and I'm, I'm going to dismiss you. I know some of you will stay in here. I know some of you will go out. I'll be around for a little bit if you want to come up and ask a question that you didn't want to ask in front of everybody else. Um, but I'll pray for us, and then I'm going to dismiss you. You should have questions in your book, uh, specifically about John 14, 15? John 15, I believe, is what it is. So let me pray for us. Father, thank you for uh, your scripture, and we're thankful that you have not left us alone. Lord, that so many of us would love to see your son, Jesus Christ, in front of us. We'd love to meet him, and we will get to someday. But we'd love for him to be in front of us now. But, you, Lord, you have told us that it is better that you are not physically here because the Holy Spirit resides in your people. Uh, Jesus, you said the kingdom of God is among us, and it is within us. Lord, help us understand how we can abide in your truth and we can realize what it is through your Holy Spirit. Jesus gave us the way and is the way. And now the Holy Spirit communicates that way to us and reinforces that we must live in the truth and live in the light based on what you have said. Help us understand and know and love you more so that we can know and love others best. In Jesus' name, amen.